Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Wabandato. I'm a program officer at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Uh, we do these town halls. There's our uh, question and answer based presentations. So there is no specific agenda. Uh, if you have questions, you can certainly uh, put them into the chat feature. I will make sure that our presenters get a chance to address those. And uh, if you don't have any specific questions, I do also have my own set to keep the conversation flowing. Uh, tonight, we are going to take a look at uh, mapping for landowners. Uh, what is that and so forth? I'll start with Josh Meisel. He's uh, one of my colleagues, as well as a professor at an instructor at Haskell Indian Nations University. Uh, so Josh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey everybody, my name is Josh Meisel, like uh, Jim has told you. Um, I've been working at Haskell as an instructor in geography and GIS for the last 10 years. Um, I'm a Haskell graduate. After my undergraduate, I moved up to KU to get my master's I'm currently working on. Uh, my PhD dissertation, hopefully I get that thing done by December. Um, a large part of my research, both as an undergraduate student at Haskell, as well as a graduate student up at the University of Kansas, has been kind of focused on um, mapping issues in Indian country, figuring out ways of taking these uh, paper data sets that, you know, bog up our file cabinets that are available at archives, and taking all that paper and figuring out a way to digitize it and make it a usable uh, GIS data product. So a large part of my research has been going back, going through archives, going through file cabinets, locating spatial data, and then bringing it into the GIS so we could do analysis and you know answer questions that have been around for a long time. Um, so. I'm just here today, whatever I could answer for you about mapping, about mapping and GIS um, back on the reservations and Indian communities, I'm here and I'm available. So thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Uh, still not catching Dave, so we'll go ahead and keep moving along. Okay. And come back to that. So you had mentioned a little bit about um, some of the things that you do can you talk a little bit more about the uses that mapping maps map in fact actually well i hesitate to do it without dave but uh that's his loss can you talk a little bit about what the difference is with the concepts of like maps mapping as an activity and uh what geographic information systems are okay so you know a lot of us were probably familiar with um the immense amount of paper material that we have in tribal offices and even at Haskell. Um, as an undergraduate student, you know, I've encountered old paper maps that may have been printed off 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, oftentimes even 100 years ago. I've gone through uh, inventory maps of the Haskell campus trying to figure out where buildings were and what their use was. Um, so that's kind of a problem or it's an issue. I wouldn't say it's a problem. It's definitely an issue in Indian country where a lot of our data and our information is stored physically on a piece of paper, a big map that people in the offices draw on with a pencil or highlight with a red ink. Um, it's always a physical media. Um, as a professor at, ha at Haskell in geography, I'm always teaching students. It's one of the big things that we try to lecture about and then uh, show actual examples of is taking that physical media, whether it's a paper map or it's an aerial image that's been drawn on with um, grease, like a grease pencil uh, to highlight certain acreage or highlight a certain parcel. Um, we're always taking those images and scanning them in and then digitizing them, making a digital copy of that physical uh, data set. Um, once we have that digital copy, we could start extracting data from it. And then number of ways to go from that, whether we're using it to produce uh, a primary data set, just copying the data on there uh, so we could have it for further analysis in the future, or just having a nice backup um, 
of that physical media. And then when it comes about for a time for analysis, or if we need a base map for something, a background image to lay new data on top of, um, we're, that's one of the primary things in Indian country is definitely taking all of our paper maps, um, our Excel tables, and then figuring out a way to create a usable data product from that. Um, that's been one of my main focuses. Um, it's been a focus through both my master's program and my PhD program up at KU is finding these unused, unutilized data sets uh, and then bringing them in to kind of the modern era by digitizing and scanning and then doing a lot of footwork to make it a usable product. Okay. Uh, one of the questions that was thrown out is would, who could have access to that digital data that you're talking about? So um, in my experience, most of my data sets are already public domain. Um, here in Lawrence, Kansas, we're about a half hour, 45 minute drive to the nearest National Archive. Um, in Kansas City, we got a branch of the National Archives. That's where most of our data is coming from. It's already in the public domain. It's just sitting in a box in Kansas City, maybe even in a cave in Kansas City, waiting to be utilized by somebody. So anybody could use it. Um, that's part of the story. So I'm always messing around with public domain information because I'm associated with the University of Kansas and I don't wanna to have to deal with um, IRBs, the Institutional Revo Review Board, you know, because I'm doing a human study. I always look for public domain information. And this is stuff that's at the archives. It's stuff that's available online, either through the archives or through the Library of Congress or it's through uh, the Bureau of Land Management. The Bureau of Land Management has a ton of our information already available online, just kind of sitting there waiting for somebody to do something with it. So I haven't had to deal with who should have access to this data or who does have access because through my research, everybody already has access. I'm just making it maybe more accessible. Um, and that's been an issue trying to figure out, you know, should this data, you know, just be out there? It's already out there. I'm always rationalizing that. I've never dealt with any sort of sensitive information, nothing that's already in the public domain. I don't know if that really answers that, but that's kind of how I've been working. Um, I have been a part of a couple of research projects through the University of Kansas, where um, working with uh, the Kansas Four Tribes, we got the Prairie Band, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Sack and Fox, and the Iowa Tribe of Nebraska and Kansas. And we've made special data portals that only they could log into um, via a KU server. So we store their data, we house their data, we make it accessible, but only to them who have uh, access to. So I've kind of been a part of both ways, but I tend to deal with the public domain just to avoid any sort of ethical drama, essentially. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Dave has been able to join us. Dave, awesome. can you go ahead and turn on your your uh, video and your voice. There we go. Awesome. So uh, you're kind of joining us in progress. Will you answer this next question or two? I'm gonna go ahead and post uh, the resources that were shared uh, with the earlier intro email from about a week or so ago. And uh, that may help as we get into some of the other topics that folks will be able to directly uh, get at some of those as you're talking about them. So if you could tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background, and then from there, I'd ask Josh to address his experience and what the difference are between say maps, the mapping process and geographic information system or GIS as we colloquially call it. Sure. Hi, Josh. Um, so I'm David Bartecki, I'm the director of Village Earth. And um, we've been, uh, I guess, working 
yeah, mostly on the Pine Ridge Reservation, but um, since about 2000. And so we've been working on a lot of, initially we we're starting on land recovery efforts. We we're trying to help families uh, utilize their individual allotments, um, their family allotments and try to get out of the range unit. And through that, uh, just mapping became a really valuable tool in, in helping families identify where their lands were and um, trying to piece together what you know what pieces they could get, what they could consolidate. Um, so we received some support from ILTF way back at, when we were doing that, and we developed a map book for Pine Ridge, and um, where families could could use that as kind of a, like a gazetteer where you could look up in the index and find your allotment or your tract ID. And then it had pages where you could find, you know, based on like a X, Y kind of coordinate thing. Um, later, we turned that, we worked with the land office and turned that into an online land information system. And um, we, we maintain that today. And uh, starting in 2017, we started up the native land information system with support from ILTF and NAF, and um, we're working on that project right now where we're trying to basically make a lot of this land information that, um, like Josh was saying, a lot of the public domain information that um, that the government produces but doesn't really make it accessible. So agriculture information, land, land status, land classifications, um, even historical land area data we're trying to get. So we're trying to just, you know, open up that black box of the BIA and the and the federal government and and make that accessible to landowners and uh, tribes, you know, for helping to to for historical documentation purposes, but also for you know contemporary land planning. So our initiative right now is we're trying to support um, pr provide information to support agricultural resource management plans and integrated resource management plans. And we're working with the Intertribal Ag Council on that project. So um, I'm happy to, to help in any way we can with mapping and using the resources we have on our site at Native Land Info or, or even anything that uh, we may have worked on in the past. Glad to be here. And the Native Land Info, I, still, I haven't gotten it posted quite yet, but it is coming up very shortly in the chat. So folks will be able to get at that. Um, when we look at maps, mapping, and uh, GIS, especially the software end of it, I know a lot of folks tend to not recognize that they've actually done quite a bit. Uh, I know I use Google Maps probably five or eight times a week. Sometimes, even if I know exactly where I'm going, can give me some heads up on when traffic might snarl up and alternative routes. Uh, and I think it's, I don't know if it's passe. I don't, in your work, do you guys have folks come across uh, Google Earth any longer? So in the class, in my classroom at, at Haskell, I encourage all the students to download and install Google Earth. Because at a minimum, if they're just taking my GIS classes to kind of get a feel for the study, uh, maybe they're trying to fulfill a requirement, whatever it is, I think everybody should have Google Earth Pro installed on their desktop PC or laptop. Um, it's an amazing tool. It's at a minimum an introduction to GIS. It does a lot of what very basic GIS does, whether you're adding data, outside data sources to the map itself, whether you're interacting with it and then generating a new map or some sort of, you know, a map for a presentation, uh, your Google Earth Pro, you get away with a lot of the same things that you could do at a very introduction level uh, using a full GIS. Um, I, I love Google Earth Pro and data comes already installed. It's streaming from the web. Um, you don't have to install or, or download it, unzip locate data sets it's already all there in google earth so i love google earth personally i don't i don't know about everybody else but i push it definitely and how much is google earth uh google earth is free yeah you can get it for free uh -huh. yeah it's even the nice. pro version is free now yeah yeah i think um uh, that's all you know if you want to make a boundary very easily 
that's probably the easiest way you can do it is, is Google My Maps or Google Earth. And there's, there's a lot of online systems that require you to upload like um, the Cropland Data Layer Viewer, USDA Viewer, or the Sturgo Viewer. They both accept KML files and both My Maps and Google Earth will create KML files very easily. Now you just said KML, what does that mean to those of us who aren't behind the scenes? Yeah, K KML is just, it stands for Keyhole Markup Language. And it's just a, a, a file format that, that Google developed for, for um, Google Earth. And it's what, what boundaries are within um, Google Maps. And so it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty universal format these days. Okay. And um, what are some of the other software that landowners might be able to use or even some of our uh, tribal staff who might be attending or observing these presentations? What are some of the things that they might be aware, should be aware of? Um, well, we, you know, since uh, when I originally took a, a GIS class back in 98, the, uh, I learned on ARC Info and Idrisi, and those were both kind of like DOS level programs at that time. But, um, uh, and then, you know, I, I learned ARC Map and, and those are, you know, professional level GIS programs. But over the years, I've been using QGIS more and that's an open source free GIS software. And every year it just gets better and better. And I almost exclusively use QGIS anymore. So if you know if you are interested in kind of taking the next step off of Google Maps and you want to get a little more, uh, you know, get your hands wet, even you know, and all the way into you know advanced raster analysis and raster reclassification, all that's you can do that in QGIS. And um, you, you use the term raster. What is that? Well, there's three types of data really in, that you can use in GIS. Maybe there's more, but <laughs> the uh, typically you have vector, which are lines and points and polygons. You know that might be a property boundary or a state boundary, or you might have points, which are houses or towns or um, wells, uh, and then you have lines, which might be like rivers or roads. And then you have uh, raster data, which is really like um, kind of like a photograph. And essentially like a, a raster would be like a satellite image or a Landsat image, which is made up of pixels. Uh, and then of course you have uh, tabular data, which is like a, a spreadsheet file, you know, where you just have uh, grids of, you know, numbers and texts and that sort of thing. And so GIS can read those three formats uh, pretty easily. That reminds me, I back in the early days of Esri's GIS software, um, I didn't learn how to do the back end stuff, but I could take existing information. And the GIS guy made me basically figure out and learn how to uh, join Excel or tabular data so that I could turn on the feature and it was a great experience actually I used it when we were doing land acquisition for a northern Wisconsin tribe that allowed me to show here's what the reservation uh, jurisdiction looks like under tribe today if we were to do the land acquisition then I could turn on the feature and show them you know how much more land would be under the tribe's control uh, and in that case that was almost a fifth of the reservation so it was a pretty substantial and that image captured a lot of people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question there. I don't want to lose it, but um, can you talk about some of the uses that you've seen? I know I included um, the 2012 Ag Census. There's a lot of data that people can get. I think your native land information system might allow for that. And I know in the past, Josh, we've had you do presentations on um, uh, the I always I'm, I'm used to thinking of it as glow. What is that? It's the is that the land office? Yes. Yeah, the general land office out of the Bureau of Land Management. They got um the BLM GLO 
website.gov, I think. I think it's a .gov website. Um, it's essentially your general land office. It's the same office back during allotment period during um, Homesteading Act that would issue uh, property deeds or titles to you know a particular section of land on a reservation or off the reservation. The general land office houses a ton of data and we're starting to kind of crack into it and make it more available, more accessible. It's already available, but more accessible to an average user. Um, that's kind of where we've been working on lately. So what I'm understanding you, Dave, or excuse me, Josh and Dave can jump in, is a lot of organizations, including the federal government and state governments are making data that we might need answers from, but you're able to use um, maps to actually get at it. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? No, absolutely. Um, there's an immense wealth of data out there. You know, most taxpayers' dollars um, the data needs to be accessible because we're all paying for it via taxes, um, but it's not really available in a in a a form that's usable. It's got to be brought in, and there's steps to get that data brought in. You know, they fulfilled their duties by making it online, um, but we're trying to bridge that gap to make it more accessible and available to the average user, so they don't have to go through. Um, jump through hoops to try to map this data. And most of this data, it's geographic in, in nature, just based off the way the data set is. It's already a geographic nature. It's talking about location. It's talking about position. It's talking about where. And as geographers, we're always dealing with the where. Um, so that's kind of where we've been at lately, uh, looking at the Bureau of Land Management's general land office their immense database, um, trying to make it more user friendly and available for people back home. Dave, I think um, since you're at your computer, you probably could pull up your native land information system. I did link it sure. as well as the QGIS on the chat feature, but if you would share your screen and maybe show folks a little bit about what uh, connecting data to the maps allows it. The way it allows for um, landowners, staff at the tribes to, and even the federal employees to much more quickly get at what the answers they're looking for. Okay, does that, that come up? Yes. Okay, so this is the Native Land Information System on the homepage. Uh, most of our data is under um, our dashboards. So dashboards combine maps and charts in a way that can make data, you know, large data sets much more um, usable. So for example, we've got the um, Census of Agriculture for American Indian Reservations, um, Cropland Data Layer, the um, National Land Cover Database. So these are all data sets that uh, are in the public domain, the government like, you know, for example, the cropland data layer, the government um, updates that every single year. And that gives you uh, crop cover, about 120 different crop type covers for the entire United States. And, and from that layer, you can calculate what's growing where to a pretty amazing accuracy. Um, and so what we've done is you can, they aggregate that at the county and the state but that doesn't do much for reservations because reservations often overlap counties and states. So what we've done is re-aggregated it at the reservation level. Um, or the, probably one of the most useful dashboards is the um, Census of Agriculture. So if anybody has seen the actual printed version of this, it's not the easiest publication to, to utilize. Um, it basically presents every reservation on one page and, uh, you know, one page per reservation. And so it's really difficult to compare across reservations or compare reservations across years because they've done this since 2007. So what we've done is combined all the data from, you can look at the 2007, 2012, 2017. Um, so you can skip across years. You can look at 
there's like 10 different categories of questions and then there's for each category you have you know it could be up to 100 different questions so if you look at land use practices or um, products market value and then you can filter by reservation so this is looking at uh, one question on here market value agriculture products sold um, for all reservations so this is giving the total and what we've done sort of a value add to this is the USDA does not publish this data they do not publish the non-native totals they only publish the reservation total and then the native total and so it's you know fairly easy to figure out the non-native total by subtracting the native from the from the non-native but We've actually added that calculation in here so you can you can see it right there. But you can go in here and filter by specific reservation. So you could look at Crow and we'll update all the totals. And then we've got population, age of producers. This is also for Crow. So each of these. You can see how these different variables change over time from the 20, 2007 to 2017. So this is this isn't necessarily mapping, but it's it's sort of a way of mapping data in a way, making it more understandable, simplifying it, because um, a lot of these are just such huge data sets. We do have some thematic maps also. This is something we're expanding on right now. Um, so. We've recently updated this US drought monitor. So if you're an ag producer, then this is a pretty valuable tool because um, the government provides support. I think they provide financial support and actually loan kind of uh, forbearance based on your what zone you fall into on these regularly updating drought, drought maps. So what we've done is we've taken their national drought map and we've just simply overlaid reservation boundaries so you can more easily find out which which zone you're in you can click on that and it should tell you what the zone class what, what drought classification is so we're just trying to take a lot of this public data and just make it more more uh usable for for tribes um here we have the an intact habitat layer so this looks at um, what are called intact habitat cores. And so these are areas where you have um, un, unbroken vegetation or un, you know, un, unbroken native vegetation. What, what breaks up habitat is really uh, plowing. So areas where ha they haven't been plowed where it's just virgin grassland. And so these are areas you wanna protect because they enhance biodiversity and and uh, climate resilience. So this is, you can see here, this is a big part of Pine Ridge where this is all cropland, but the rest of this, since it's mostly rangeland, it has never been really disturbed in that sense. So Dave, yeah. in your data sets, do you, have you been able to get a um, trust uh, layer added so that folks can kind of be a, differentiate trust land from the surrounding lands or not yet? No, we've we've requested that from the BIA. Um, they have not. They have not. Uh, even though it's technically it's in the public domain, there's nothing that restricts it. Restricts it in that sense. As long as it doesn't have personal identifying information, it's in the public domain, and all kind of um, uh, plat data is in the public domain. But uh, the BI just is not uh, sharing that data. <laughs> since there is a way, you know, there is a way you can map patent data to to try to reconstruct that to some extent. But um, we haven't been successful at doing that on a national scale. But, well, and to be direct with the audience, uh, I do want to point out that, in as much as the information that you have on your native land information system, as well as the uh, getting something like um, reservation level mapping or map parcels available. Uh, those are things that we do 
from the foundation want to be conscientious and careful with, because even though, as you point out, there is public domain information, it tells a very clear story in certain ways about tribal communities. And we, I know my perspective is to pay attention and talk with tribal leaders as we go through some of those conversations so that uh, they are able to protect as much data sovereignty as is practical. I mean, ultimately, uh, in the GIS world, the whole concept of data sovereignty is critical and important to uh, the tribal GIS community, but there is so much information out there that it, it is almost too late to try and protect things. Fortunately, I don't know that too much is out there because most people don't pay attention to Indian tribes, but uh, it is something that we do. I did want to point out as we talk about that issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's worth, it's definitely worth discussion because the um like you're right the, the data is out there as far as you know there's companies like ihs market who are big contractors for blm and they can essentially you know generate that data for any oil company that wants it <laughs> but um it's it's not a you know the way you obtain that is from the tribe and um from the land office you know upon their permission so it is it's possible to get and um uh, if the tribe wants to make that available. Okay, I might have you switch back uh, to face view. So yeah, go ahead. Like I said, the link for the native land information system is on the chat feature. So if you go into your chat, you should be able to find that. If not, you can certainly let me know and we can and get that to you at a later date. There is another question about where you have trained your uh, Boundary layers. Did you make those oh. or did you find those? And if it's findable, is it, I guess, what I would consider a shape file that could be added? Yeah, the the boundary layers come from the, the Census Bureau. So it's there's they're uh, both the, the Census Bureau tiger line files, that's what they call them. And uh, but then also the BIA puts them out as they call them land area representations. But uh, I find the census the Census Bureau has an open process for challenging it that tribes can can uh, you know they can contest boundaries and uh, they regularly do and so that we prefer to use the census boundaries just because that's possible. The bureau mostly focuses on just what's sort of uh, in their books and uh, not necessarily what what is broadly representing the tribes. So. That's why I prefer using the, the Census Bureau. But both are are publicly available, open, you know, in, in the public domain data sets. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and kind of move the conversation a little bit differently. Um, and I'll start with Josh first, but certainly would welcome you, Dave, to address that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the difference between learning GIS um, and teaching GIS? Because I know you both train other people yeah um so my experience um you know my background kind of led me towards gis i stumbled upon it as a field um at haskell um i was a computer nerd i was a math nerd science nerd i didn't have any focus and when i was working as a just a computer technician in a computer lab it ended up being the gis lab you know, so I sat in on lectures while I'm fixing computers. I, I just, I found like a innate kind of attraction towards it. It's like, here's an application of all this stuff that I've been learning all these years. Um, here's an application of these skills I've learned. Um, so learning it for me was hands-on. Um, I did a lot of hands-on um, training whether it's you know working through a project that my mentors and my advisors at Haskell uh, kind of pushed on me, or whether it was a, a research project that me and my fellow students um, and other GIS interns at Haskell developed on our own and worked on from beginning to end. Um, GIS is definitely a skill that you learn by doing it. Um, you could sit in a, a classroom all day and, you know, be lectured at, but until you get your hands on the software and get interested in a particular project that you want to do, um, it could be kind of difficult and it, it could be daunting. It's a big data set and, and, and it's a big software. There's lots, 
of little ins and outs to the, just the software itself. Um, so I've always taught GIS by hands-on. We do a lot of hands-on the computer uh, doing GIS and then learning it uh, via doing it. Um, it's, just, it's the way I learned it. It's the way I teach it. It may not be the best way of learning and teaching, um, but just like any skill practice makes perfect, uh, the more often you use uh, a particular technology, the better you will get at it. Um, that's basically it. You know, we, we always try to teach with hands-on experience, um, project-based learning at Haskell. Um, we only have one class that's really a lecture. It's an intro because nobody knows what GIS is. So we try to lecture a lot, introduce the software. But then beyond that, all our upper level classes, it's we're working GIS every day. We're working on a project, if not working towards a goal towards the end of the semester. So it's a it's a learn by doing situation for me. Definitely. Okay. Um, and so it sounds like there are classes people can take at college. Um, I know I'll kind of do a quick shout out. This last couple of years, uh, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation has been working to uh, create opportunities to at least engage tribal youth in the fact that GIS exists as a field, as a potential for career. Um, our target is, <clears throat> excuse me, probably around 13, 14, 15 year olds, but uh, it really comes down to what the tribal communities want to do in working with the foundation. Uh, we piloted it this summer to see how things would go with the uh, Lakota Ray Ojibwe community in North Central Wisconsin. And for the summer of 2023, uh, we're still doing some fundraising and hoping to do probably about five, maybe six tribal communities still here in, the, in our region so that we have much cleaner uh, reach to support those projects. Ultimately, I think tribal youth can see this for what we've talked about. Um, ways to understand information, process information. Uh, Story Maps is a third party, but well, it's not a third party, it's an Esri software add-on. So unfortunately you do have to use Esri software to use Story Maps, but uh, in most tribal communities, uh, tribal staff and school kids can get them for free from Esri. Uh, but I just wanna kind of mention that it is something for both of you, are there resources out there for landowners and for ag farmers and ranchers that would help them kind of grow a little bit through the learning curve that you're aware of? I'll let Dave answer this one. He's deep and dirty in this type of research. So Dave, please help me out with it. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially what we're trying to do is, is uh, make a lot of the data available that farmers and ranchers and, and landowners need. Um, if we don't have, you know, if there's something you're looking for, then then let us know that, because that could be something we could try to add. Um, as far as um, kind of do-it-yourself resources, I mean, every day I think a lot of these tools are, or at least, you know, um, different government agencies and organizations are trying to make data more available. Uh, maybe not as fast as they should, but you know there are like tools like the uh, cropland data layer and the Cergo soils data. Um, they do have web interfaces that you can, you know, if you can upload your own boundary file, then um, you can get that data on your own. Uh, I what I would recommend is starting out with a very basic, you know, watch watch a YouTube kind of introductory video on on GIS. And learn the basic terminology, and then from there, because you can pretty. I'm pretty much self-taught. I took one intro level course, and then everything I've done, I've kind of taught myself through YouTube and uh, different online forums. Um, so with something you know, with QGIS being free, you can find tutorials on just about anything. So really think about a specific something you want to accomplish with GIS. And if you know the, you know how to ask the questions, you can find how to do it on on uh, QGIS if you on YouTube if you have the time to to spend on that. Okay. But of course, there are also a lot of online 
you can find free and, and low cost online courses. Okay. But what I'm hearing both of you describe is that it's something that you want to spend time learning. It's not, it's not something that's going to just be picked up uh, with a fairly easy, um, trying to think the pathway, but because uh, I know there are certain pieces of software like Facebook. I mean, you don't really need a tutorial on how to do Facebook. Um, Snapchat might be a little bit different to do certain features, but again, they're fairly straightforward. What I'm hearing you describe as GIS is a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah, it depends. I mean, there's, there's, um, you know, you can starting with Google Maps is a good way to just get some basic, you know, you can you can accomplish a lot with with basic GI, you know, uh, Google Maps if you just want to create boundaries or figure out the area of a, you know, of your pasture of your property, you can do that pretty easily with Google Maps. Okay, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll probably tackle this. There's a question from the audience that said, who maps shared lands, uh, like public domain or somewhere where no specific tribe might own it? I uh, mentioned several tribes might use them for maybe traditional sacred lands, sweat lodges, gatherings, and other things. And what I can say is every tribe I've worked with when there are cultural issues at play, are protective even within their own staff. Um, I worked in the land office and there were certain pieces that our TIPO officers uh, did not want in the system because they couldn't control who might eventually get into that system. So that's generally been my experience. Uh -huh. I need to duck out real quick. So hopefully you guys could tackle this. Uh, let me see here. Got about five to seven more minutes. Uh, like I said, I need to go let somebody into our building. Uh, start off maybe with something that we haven't talked about that is of interest to you or so that you think the audience might uh, should know about. Like I said, I don't really have a specific question or format for that, but uh, as we've gone through the different issues, you've heard some of the questions. What are things, like I said, the, if you were to have a last word or, or something that somebody really should know about in the, uh, from our audience? Do you want to go first, Dave, or do you want me to go? Yeah, feel free, Josh. Okay. So, I mean, if I got one thing to mention to everybody is that if you're working in a tribal office, if you're working in a land office, in an EPA um, range office, whatever it is, working for the tribe, you should have access to ArcGIS and Esri products. Um, you know, I learned QGIS, I learned R, MATLAB, all of that stuff up at KU in the university. Um, but back home, um, working with the BIA, working with the BIE at Haskell, the Bureau of Indian Education, um, we have a contract with Esri and Esri provides us a discount for their full software platform, whether it's the online version or the desktop version. Um, we have a very discounted price. Um, most reservations, most tribal communities, I'm pretty sure, have that same deal with them. Uh, it's a contract made between the Department of the Interior and the software company uh, ESRI, Esri. So we should all have access to GIS, whether we want it or not, we should all have access to it if we wanted it. Um, with that access, you have um, the ability to go work through tutorials. Uh, the Esri Arc GIS company, they provide an immense amount of tutorials on how to learn GIS. And um, everybody has access to that. You can work through a series of tutorials and then become certified in it even. They offer a particular certification through the Esri software company. Um, I'm not an Esri salesman. You know, I, I, I learn all different types of software. I don't necessarily prefer Esri over QGIS or GRASS or any of these other open source softwares that have been around. 
Um, it just happens to be because I work in academia, because I work, you know, with students and I'm trying to get them ready um, in case they get a job back home. If they move back home and they work for the real estate office or if they work for the land office or for the EPA, they all need a little bit of introduction to GIS so they can perform their job um, efficiently. Uh, that's my big one. So anybody worried about software access, you, you should have it if you work for a tribe already. Um, and then the data side is a whole other thing. There's so many data sets out there that are already open source, waiting to be picked through and utilized properly. Um, they always talk about, so one of the quotes, I don't know who said this. Um, it's a quote that I've stolen from one of my mentors at some point up at KU. Um, but the person who makes the maps controls the dialogue about the land. So I always try to emphasize that to my students. The people making the maps, they kind of dictate what gets said about a particular piece of land. You know, and you know, relating to Native Americans back in Indian country, that should be us. We should be the ones making the maps about our lands, making that dialogue, controlling the dialogue, um, pushing forth the knowledge, you know, instead of going to the government for a map, go to the source, you know, so I'm always emphasizing the use of these various geographic technologies, um, trying to bring back the power to the people's hands. Um, let us ask the questions, let us answer them. Let us be the resource um, where people go to for mapping concerns and land concerns. Uh, that's a that's about it. If Dave, you got any ideas, please cut me off. Yeah, um, Scott Mitzner uh, asked a question: Is there a learning progression course of study that to, that build on each other? And I posted a um, a really good one that is regularly updated for QGIS, and it's a very like starts out with the you know the bare bones of GIS, and then takes you all the way through up to like you know complex raster analysis and classification and um it's very easy to follow and the great thing is it's all based on free software so um and you know it's really not if you know it, it, it you know you can't go directly from qgis to, to arcmap but once you know the basic principles it's pretty easy to, to transition so if you do you know get a job in a in a department that's going to require using arcmap then you should be able to transition fairly easy it is. That's the truth. Um, they are different software entities. Things are laid out a little bit different. Um, most of all the algorithms and the tools that you use, they function the same way. They may be labeled different or called something slightly different. Um, but, you know, if you learn one software and you get comfortable with it, it's a very easy transition to make going in between QGIS and uh, the ArcGIS software. So Dave, are there uh, any last thoughts? You, you tackled Scott's question. Uh, got about five minutes left. Anything that uh, you wanna make sure people know before we start wrapping up? Yeah, I mean, I just like to, to uh, you know, repeat my call that uh, if you have specific things you're trying to to research or or uh, map, then you know feel free to to fire me an email at david at villager.org. We're always interested in helping landowners and, and uh, land caretakers. And um, you know if if we can't answer it, then we can try to point you toward the the data set or or approach that you can take to to answer the question. But that's what we're trying to do is just you know, put really valuable information on our site that, that tribes can use in a practical way. So, um, I'm following a Nebraska case where a town annexed common tribal land zoned it for development. Yeah, see that's, um, yeah, researching those land histories, I think is, is pretty, uh, pretty valuable. And that's where Josh's research on mapping the glow data can be pretty valuable because um, you can really find exactly when lands were patented or fee patented or annexed um, in that glow database down to the parcel level. 
So it's a pretty valuable tool for that kind of historical research. Or if you want to use it, you know, in a, in a court case or, or whatnot. Okay. Well, that's uh, the questions I had laid out. I try to keep these things short and sweet, knowing that folks uh, are sacrificing their evenings, but especially for the producers and for landowners uh, while we're at work, uh, this is the time that they can set aside. And I respect that you're here. Go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you, Dave. Thank Josh. Um, you guys have been great in helping our audience, I think, get through some of the basics. Uh, if there are in, we will be sending out a follow-up and asking folks what they thought of the presentation, if we forgot something, or if there are other issues that you'd like us to tackle, both within mapping, GIS, but also in general land ownership, certainly let the foundation know and we can try and tackle some of that in future town hall sessions. Uh, my colleague does uh, webinars, and those webinars also can be available to uh, folks, whether they're there at the first, uh, during the actual presentations, or uh, you can get access to our Vimeo channel for the webinars, our YouTube channel for the uh, town halls, and that will give you access to the full videos uh, going back about a, almost two years now, certainly a year and a half uh, when uh, Nicholas started some of his first webinars. So uh, the foundation exists to make sure that uh, folks who work in Indian country have a good and live in Indian country have a good understanding of what the issues are and how those issues work. Uh, again, appreciate everyone coming this evening and I hope uh, you found that very useful. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Josh. Yep. Thank you all.